a context that is most clearly not their own, sort of like the Venetian court. And one picture I particularly remember is one where Mary is portrayed as a Renaissance princess, all dressed up in these fine clothing, living in this spacious room and attended to by a bevy of ladies in waiting, just like Queen Elizabeth. And I'm sure there were even pictures of Jesus riding his donkey into Jerusalem, although I don't remember that. The one, the one of Mary really caught my eye. And all the figures in the pictures looked like they're painters and they looked like the people who would admire them. That is, they all had white European skin, light straight hair, and often blue eyes. The context presented to the patrons who would buy or look at this art was that all of these figures who lived their lives in, a Semitic, in the Semitic nation in the Middle East looked, and most importantly, probably acted like the Europeans who were looking at the paintings. In other words, the figures in these much portrayed religious paintings that the faithful admired for centuries were completely miscast. No one even remotely resembled or acted like the people that they were supposed to represent. Our understanding of Jesus and everyone associated with him has been colored by this type of artwork. <clears throat> if you check out crucifixes in white American churches, most of them show a pure white body broken upon the cross. Pictures of Mary often portray her with blonde hair and blue eyes. And the figures all look more like Vikings than they do like ancient Jews. And then there's another misrepresentation of Jesus that gets me every time. His pale white face is often associated with a thin, weak victim with little muscle mass. You know, he's, he's really, really thin because why would Jesus need muscles? And his hands are tied and be obediently and he's humbly going off to be crucified. Compliments of the suffering servant motif in Isaiah. And I dare say, and who am I? I don't know, but I dare say that all of these pictures are completely wrong because they are taken out of context. So today, I just, we thought we, I would, we would briefly put them into the context in which they were drawn, a context that was always available to everyone, us, all the artists, all the theologians, and that context is scripture. So we've all seen magnetic preachers on TV, the kind that draws thousands of people to listen to them. And while I'm not convinced that thousands showed up to see Jesus and listen to him, do you think a pale, weak, humble man would have the charisma to even attract a couple hundred of people to what appears to be religious revivals all over the country? Do you think a suffering servant would show up at the house of the wealthy Simon the leper and Zacchaeus to be wined and dined in style? Do you think a weak and muscle, muscle with, man with little muscle mass would argue passionately with the scribes and the Pharisees? Do you think a weak person could face up and address, face up to and address elite status men like Jarius or the Roman centurion? I don't think so. And the fact is that Jesus was what the Greeks call a tecton, that is a man who worked with his arms and his hands. So that meant that those arms and hands wielded tools like hammers and axes every day, all day. And while Jesus was probably not very tall, he certainly had to be very strong in order to earn his living as a construction worker. And he wasn't pale either because he had the skin tone of an Eastern European. Jesus was also very smart. He knew how to use the current milieu to his advantage. His very best side, the one that is 100% ignored, is his street theater. When modern law-abiding religious folks rush to condemn and outlaw protesters, they often forget the flagrant boldness of a nobody of a man who rode a donkey into the great capital city of Jerusalem during the potentially violent Jewish High Holy Days, while his followers, men nobodies just like him, were waving palm fronds and shouting a choir of hosannas to honor him. And according to Mark, they chanted, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor, David. Well, that last sentence is fighting words and they are far from humble 
and Jesus apparently did not do one thing to stop their hosannas. Seems like he was on a roll, and so were his followers, who were probably all excited and juiced up by the action. I mean, imagine being there. <laughs> you know, here's your follower walking into the into the city, and everybody's yelling and screaming and carrying on. You just get caught up into the magic. <clears throat> the citizens of Jerusalem didn't like the occupying Romans, and they would have loved to have them gone. And it was the belief in the restoration of David's kingdom and not a recognition of Jesus as the son of God that made them lay down their cloaks and wave their palm fronds. It was enough to set the teeth of the Romans and the local governments on edge because Jesus's action could have sparked a bloody violent riot. Then Jesus's next act added insult to injury. After his escapade on Sunday, he had the cheek to go into the great temple of Jerusalem, which was much bigger than the cathedral of St. Peter and Paul in Philadelphia, and all by his lonesome, throw out the money changers. He even had the temerity to call the beloved temple a den of thieves. Can you imagine? So this might have soured the support of some Jerusalemites who earned their living selling sacrificial animals in the temple. But we know Jesus hardly went about pleasing people. He and his actions and his words annoyed a great many people. So when you place the words and actions of Jesus in the context of Holy Week, there appears to be two reasons why Jesus' actions and words led to his arrest and execution a couple days later. The later understanding of Jesus as a pale, sexless male specimen, a weak and meek and mild and humble victim has for too long discolored the scriptural picture of a brash, a bold, a brazen, fearless and powerful, bigger than life man who was willing to take all sorts of chances with his own life. But as the events of Holy Week will prove, he was not willing to take chances with the lies of those he loved. All of the religious and secular powers on earth have feared this Jesus set in the original context, right there in scripture for everybody to see. The context is the challenging Jesus, the annoying Jesus, the in your face Jesus, the turn the tables on the powers Jesus. And so he was tamed and reformatted in modern, modern parlance almost from the beginning as early Christian fathers and doctors of the church coded him with images of the Old Testament that were time specific and so had nothing at all to do with him. It was the powers who made him despised, rejected, a meek lamb willingly and obediently led to the slaughter. I think I might've said this before, but it has always been my firm belief that the church that grew up in his name didn't like this good news Jesus. And so they invented revelation and the magisterium where centuries of speculative thought detached Jesus and his mother and his followers from the original context and created something totally different. By giving weight to their own pronouncements made in human words instead of God's, they could control the message. Jesus was obedient to the powers unto death, and so should you be. But my friends, our God does not call us to death. The divine calls us to life, abundant life, pressed down and overflowing into our laps and into everyone else's lap as well. Jesus exemplified this divinely abundant life in his ceaseless care for the sick and the suffering and the grieving and the poor and the oppressed without ever asking if they deserved it or worrying that they might misuse it. His raucous side, and I want you to really think about this, his raucous side on Palm Sunday should be seen in this context so that when we read the story of a purported king riding a jackass into the gleaming capital city of Jerusalem, followed by a ragtag group of followers waving palm fronds and chanting Hosanna in clear view of the imperial troops, we should be absolutely impressed with his courage and daring do. Jesus didn't give a hoot about those powers. In fact, he didn't give a hoot about any human powers. He was tired of them. 
in his kingdom, his kingdom did not lay, did not lie in the context of the powers. The powers did not matter. And that's why the powers had to wrest his message away and create a new one. So I don't know about you, but I happen to like my version of the big, brash, brown, God smacked Jesus. For me, Jesus was never this little, pure little white spotless lamb led willingly to a slaughter, never. But he was a man who turned the world upside down, risking his life to bring the good news of God's loving kingdom to the poor and the oppressed in every way he could. How about you?